Well, hello, Tipton Baptist, and welcome to Bible Study Time. Uh, today is April 8th, uh, 2021, so we're getting into the month of April. Bible Study Times can continue. Uh, we've just come through Easter and, and a wonderful celebration together as, as a body of believers at Tipton, along with the church around the world celebrating the resurrection of Christ. Uh, today, midweek or so, in this first week of April, getting into the second week of April, we get down to just a real focused look at something in, in the book of Matthew. So if you have your Bibles, uh, turn to Matthew 544. This is where we're going to be today. Uh, so as you're turning there, I'm just going to pray and ask God for uh, his wisdom as we look at his word and that we might walk away uh, really challenged and uh, equipped and eager to do the thing that it is that Jesus has for us to do. So as you're turning there, I'm going to pray and just bow with me. Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you for the teaching in it. I thank you, God, that your words have been recorded by human hands, words that came out of your mouth, Lord Jesus, while you were here on this side of the, of the grave, uh, words that we can hear and learn from generation after generation, including today. So, Lord, help us hear and learn and be eager to do the things that you've directed us to do. We love you, Jesus, and we ask you for, for more love for you and more of a trust and faith and belief in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, Matthew 5.44, simply stated, it's on your screen. Uh, it's in my Bible right here. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This is a devotional style Bible study because this is a command. This is right from Jesus as he's teaching there are hard things that he says that we read many times and we just gloss over because we know what we're supposed to and we know it's the churchy thing to do and we know that's what Christians are supposed to be or to do. And this is no different. This is a thing that we read and we like, okay, I'm going to love my enemies. But think about this for a minute. Jesus stated this in no uncertain terms and it wasn't an, a negotiable point. He said, you, the hearers of mine, you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. When I was reading through this, I put it, I put it down the other day. Uh, a few days back as I was preparing this, I was reading through and I saw this and this jumped out at me and this is where I believe that God had for us to go. For whatever reasons in your lives right now, this is where I think God had for us to go. It's where he had for me to go. This is where he has for us as a body to go and to consider and to ponder. But really hear what he's saying. Loving your enemies, praying for your enemies, this is not something that we can just do. We don't just choose to do this. There are lots of times we can do things for our enemy where we might do something nice or trying to be kind for an enemy. And it could be absolutely superficial. And a person who is in opposition to us and perhaps in opposition to God directly, therefore in opposition to us, we can be kind to a person and have a heart that is absolutely soiled and dirty and not genuine. They might never know, nor would the whole world maybe nor know, just to see us be kind. Being kind to an enemy and loving your enemy are two different things, because we can be kind in ways that aren't genuine. But loving your enemy, God sees that, and it has to be genuine, or it's not love. Loving our enemies. Look at what Jesus is actually saying. Loving and praying for our enemies. This is not a negotiable point. This is a command. But there's a command and there's a direction in the command given. And it has to do with this, this idea of praying. Love by praying for. When you look at the original language that Jesus was using, when you look at his actual speech, loving your enemy was done by praying for them. It's not like, well, you need to love them and you need to pray for them. No, it was, you need to love them by praying for them. That's how you love them. That's the how of the what to do. The idea here is that you're bringing an enemy before the Lord. And when you do this, if you're going to be obedient to the call and command of Jesus Christ, if you're going to come before the Lord and you're going to bring my enemy with me, my enemy, I'm going to pray for my enemy, God, see my enemy? You're going to bring the heart of your enemy before God. Lord, see their heart? But when you do that, you're also bringing your own heart. And the truth of the matter is, I think what Jesus has in mind here, or at least a part of what he has in mind is for you to love your enemy the way that God's commanded for you to do, bringing their heart before the Lord, praying on their behalf for their heart to be changed, you must bring your own heart. You must bring all of your rights, 
all of your systems of belief, all of the principles that make you not the one who's wrong, but your enemy's the one who's wrong. You bring all of that anyway before the Lord with his heart or her heart. You bring your heart and you're, what you're asking actually is this. I'm loving my enemy by praying for them. My prayer brings me right to you with their heart. That means you see both our hearts and you begin to work on them. I trust that your work on this person's heart, my enemy's heart. But before I can even consider seeing change in my enemy, I'm coming to you, God, and saying, I'm going to pray for my enemy by asking you, God, to give me a heart for my enemy that you have, therefore changing my heart for my enemy. This is what Jesus is really prodding and pushing us into. He doesn't tell us to love our enemies in any way less than having our heart formed and molded to be more like Christ's. And the truth is, if you're going to sit with me and listen to Jesus' teaching, you, if you're going to be honest with yourself, like me being honest with myself, we need God to make us more like Christ because we are not like him, not on our own. We don't love enemies. We hate them. And we justify our hatred. There's a lot of depth in this verse. There's a lot of implications in, in, in how to live this out. But before we can even get to any of those, we must start here. Loving our enemies is bringing ourselves before the Lord. It's coming and asking God literally for a, 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 a switching of mind and switching of heart. Um, this idea of loving and praying for is literally in Greek, interacting with the Lord by asking God to switch your wishes for the person of whom you're praying. It's actually coming to God and saying, God, the wish that I have for my enemy, switch it out and make it what your wish is for my enemy, what your desire is for my enemy. That's maybe where we should go. Interestingly, if any of you have ever had a situation where you've had an enemy or a person that's in opposition to you or a person you just don't get along with and you butt heads, if that's ever been a circumstance in your life, uh, in your lives, then Think back, perhaps, to maybe one of those circumstances where one of the people who had been in opposition to you for a long period of time ended up becoming your friend. I think of a time in first grade. My first grade, I was at a Christian school. The first day of first grade, I was nervous. I didn't know anyone there, or at least I had thought I didn't know anyone there. So I show up to school, and lo and behold, a boy who went to church with me named Michael was at school. Michael and I went into first grade happy. At least we knew each other in a room full of kids that we didn't know. And we began to be growing in friendship we just within the first few hours of the first day of first grade. Well, at recess, we kind of separated for a time. And I come back to Michael finding that a bigger second grade boy was pushing Michael up against a tree. And uh, as he was pushing Michael against a tree, Michael was hitting his head. And that made me mad. So I went to this bigger kid from behind. As, even though I was small and short, apparently I was feisty enough that I grabbed him by the shirt from behind... And I just kind of threw him down and then I scuffed dirt on him. <laughs> Told him not to do that. And immediately I was taken to the principal's office. And the principal tried to, without laughing, saying, we don't throw kids down and scuff dirt on them. And the principal was very kind and very loving and he gently directed me to do things right. And he also disciplined the boy who was wrong in second grade. The bottom line is this. This second grader was an instant enemy of mine and my friend Michael's. About a month later, the second grader and I began to talk we made amends, he became my friend. And this enemy who became a friend was my friend throughout school. I left that Christian school I was attending in the fourth grade, went to a rival Christian school, and this young man continued to be my friend. This kid who had been a second grader that had been my enemy, he continued to be my friend all through high school. We, can, we remained friends, and we would play against each other in sports and in all kinds of things, but we remained friends. God built a friendship there. Whenever I went to college, I began at Penn State University. I quickly transferred to Liberty, as you know, and I finished there. Well, lo and behold, I show up to Liberty University. I'm in dorm six. Guess who's in my dorm on the same hall as me? The same kid who in second grade was the bully who would become my friend. And we remained friends all through college. It's amazing what God can do with an enemy when he changes hearts. Not just the enemies, but our heart where we end up going arm in arm, linked together, going at the same goal. That's what God had done. And while you might say, well, you know, Pastor Jason, that's a really weak argument. First grade issues. I have real life issues here I'm dealing with. The truth of the matter is, most of the time when we're angry at an enemy, most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, 
our perspective and arguments and justification for our sinful perspective of an enemy is just as weak and pithy as a first grader's. We do not have real justification to be disobeying Jesus' command in Matthew 5.44. So, I'm telling you that after I've been telling myself that and hearing from God for my own life and heart in this area. So don't think I'm just pointing fingers. I'm just as susceptible to the same disobedient heart as anyone who's listening to this right now. All I'm saying is, don't let a heart that might be principally right be practically wrong when working uh, and trying to deal with matters and circumstances relating to humans who are our enemy. God can change hearts and lives, and he does. Take your enemy before the Lord. You'll love them by praying for them. Praying for them exposes both your heart and their heart. When you do this, when you take your enemy before the Lord and you pray for them, you're loving them in a way that can't be greater. But you're also drawing yourself and opening and, and making yourself absolutely vulnerable to the Lord that he might change you. And you can't hide your heart before the Lord. He sees it anyway. Why is this important? This is important because it's a healthy thing for you to go before the Lord, prostrate, humbly saying, before I can expect my enemy's heart to change, God, I, I need you to make sure mine is right. So Jesus' example and instruction and command is good not only for your enemy's change, but it's good for your and my change in taking our enemy before the Lord. It's the most loving thing we can do to bring the enemy with their heart before the Lord because we're going before the Lord as well, looking for God to change us both, to be more like him. What do we do to take away here? Well, pray. Jesus said in Matthew 5, read it again with me. I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Love by praying for your enemies. Love them. And prayer is the number one step, the first step we take. We need to pray. You need to think right now in your lives. Who is it right now? What human is in opposition with you? Or what human has caused you just all oh, anxiety or, or, or heartache or or disturbing things have happened with you and another person, or, or anger, or unforgiveness. What person is that? Pause. You have that person in mind? As soon as I'm done with this, and I pray, hang up this Bible study and take that person before the Lord so that both their heart and your heart are exposed. That's what we do. We just take the first step and then let God work from there. Let him show you what step is next. But pray. It's a healthy thing. God will influence you and your enemy when we obey the command of Christ. So I hope this Bible study has met you where you are. I believe it has, at least for some. It has for me. And may God bless you as you continue looking at Matthew and all the teaching of Jesus in it. Uh, I look forward to seeing you all soon. I know Pastor Brandon's going to be with you this Sunday. Excited to see what he has to bring for us. Uh, but I'll be seeing all of you soon. Oh, and be sure to check. I'll have a, a Friday word of encouragement somewhere over the weekend. Uh, keep an eye out for that too. So until I see you again, God bless. Stay in the Word.